we focus on, as she shared, two bodies of work. One is e-mobility best practices, and the second area is e-mobility diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so our approach is to really utilize a human-centric approach to engage with our partners and do our work. We are driven by work around, uh, in terms of thinking about the public health implications and equity in the transportation sector. And so we're working to advance equitable e-mobility solutions, particularly multimodal e-mobility solutions that are connected shared autonomous technologies. And so we work with a whole host of different partners ranging from OEMs to utilities to government agencies to charging networks as well as community-based organizations, CNC and delivery companies as well. For us, we believe that we envision a world where all communities have access to this innovative technology. We want to make sure that it's widely accessible and available to particularly frontline communities who have been impacted worse than first by climate change. And so we believe that this world is a there is an opportunity to you know increase access as well as awareness to this technology. But in order to do that, you really have to engage with frontline communities to help unlock the potential for electrification. We're also, myself and Terry Travis, co-founded EV Hybrid Noir. And EV Hybrid Noir is a 501c3 nonprofit. It's the nation's largest network of diverse EV drivers and owners and enthusiasts. And so it's made up primarily of Black and Latinx drivers and enthusiasts from across the globe. So we have uh, thousands of members across the United States, Canada, Europe, Southeast Asia, the continent of Africa, as well as a growing presence in the Caribbean. And so here you can see many of our chapters align with major metropolitan areas. And so uh, again, here we are working to accelerate equitable e-mobility solutions to all communities. So when we think about mobility, it means more than getting from point A to point B. So transportation provides an opportunity for upward mobility. It helps you get access to health and uh, health and medical care, education, workforce, and economic development opportunities. Uh, you know, access to residential mobility and environmental quality. And so, what we know from research is that for the past 100 plus years or so, owning a vehicle really has increase one's access to be one of the most powerful economic advantages and drivers that a family can have. Charging infrastructure, when we think about the availability of charging in different neighborhoods, this is really impacted by home home ownership and the home ownership gap. So home ownership is a major factor in available transportation options and charging access uh, infrastructure and wealth building. And this continued disparity that we see is an aggregated effect of both the social economic divides that frontline communities face and that continue to serve as barriers for electrification. So here you can see this, the demographics in terms of home ownership for the different racial and ethnic groups. Here you can see that in terms of looking at vehicle ownership, that in the nation's uh, largest metropolitan areas, almost 8 million individuals don't have access to a private vehicle. And so the majority of vehicles, uh, uh, zero vehicle, as we call them zero vehicle households, they're in cities and they are individuals who are uh, recognized as lo earning lower income. So conversely, those households that have a higher income tend to be in the suburbs, they end up being middle or higher earners, or higher income individuals. And so this uh, locational and income characteristics of zero, uh, zero vehicle households really reinforces the need for stronger transportation services, but transportation services that are electrified and utilize clean transportation. So these zero emission households also end up having to commute much further to their employment, um, which is not typically suited uh, you know, to, uh, to get to in a timely manner because of the lack of transportation options. This is another issue that is, uh, you know, something that frontline communities, communities of color face in terms of, of access to charging. And so in order for individuals and communities to adopt this new technology, based on research that we facilitated, we find that 
there's some hesitancy in terms of there's a barrier around adoption. One of those barriers is knowledge. Another barrier is access to charging infrastructure. And so having access to charging infrastructure in your neighborhood is a significant predictor of um, you know, being able to accelerate and adopt EV. In order to change this paradigm and engage more communities, we have to start engaging with communities. And so what does that mean? Well, that means is that you have to engage communities or the people or the individuals that are most affected and impacted by the problem. And so what we say in our work is that those who are closest to the problem probably have a really good idea in terms of what is needed to address whatever the, ba the barrier or the gap is or the challenges. So we say that they're most likely uh, the ones that are closest to the solution. So that's why we have to listen and lean into them. So what are some of the best ways to address the needs of communities? Well, first of all, we have to listen. We have to sometimes just be still and try to better understand what the root causes of the problems are, what some of the barriers are. And so that's why I started off this conversation with providing this historical context of transportation and e-mobility, because you have to have an understanding of that to begin to address some of these issues and understand why we're seeing some of these patterns and trends and inequities that we see today. 